Mm. Well, welcome. Obviously, I'm dressed weird. <laughs> the first thing I'm going to do is <coughs> take some of this off so I can... There's this really weird echo when you're wearing a bonnet like this. So, oh, uh, that's much better already. Whew! Plus, um, you know, now you get to see my non-regulation um, Civil War era haircut. <laughs> So last week we were talking about um, the time leading up to the Civil War. And now we're going to get into the time immediately before the Civil War and whatever happened after that. So today I'm going to introduce you to someone who, strangely enough, is one of my very best friends. She was born 125 years before I was. But once I met her, I knew that we were soul sisters. And um, she'll forever be my best friend, and someday I'm going to actually get to meet her in person. So her name is Phoebe Beach, and she is the niece of Mrs. Fessenden, who we talked about last week. And uh, she was raised by the Fessendens in South Bridgeton. So way back in, I don't even know what year, 2000 and something, um, I started to do a history project. And that history project was part of a um, history celebration for the South Bridgeton Congregational Church. So what I was going to do is I was going to take all of the pastors that had served the church, and I was going to do just a little um, biographical piece about the pastor and the pastor's spouse, which in the case of that church they were all um, wives, so pastors and pastor's wives. And I was going to record that all for uh, the church history. Well, I still haven't written that, and that was, I think it was 2003 when I started that project, uh, 2004 maybe. Something else happened along the way, which is, you know, pretty typical of life. I, um, in researching the Fessendens, I came across this newsletter. And it was for um, a library at Radcliffe College. And it was talking about this diary that they had just purchased. And the diary came from an estate sale. And it was purchased by a, a rare book dealer. And then it was then purchased by Radcliffe for their library collection. They have a huge collection of women's diaries, <coughs> manuscripts, letters. It's really fascinating that they have focused on that and collected so many things that would otherwise have been lost. So this diary was in a, um, it was in a cigar box marked pencils. So they were writing this little excerpt about the diary and there was this young woman from South Bridgeton, Maine and her name was Phoebe Beach and she was the uh, adopted daughter of um, Joseph Fessenden and his wife Phoebe. And it talked about how life was during that period of time. And it, it happened to start in 1857. So it was right before um, we ended up <coughs> in a very tragic war uh, that still has, um, it's still with us. And um, it, it's amazing to me how fascinated people are by the Civil War. So it, it sounded to me like something that I really needed to go read. So I have some friends who lived not too far from Cambridge, and they said, why don't you come down and stay with us, and we will drive you into the city every day and pick you up at the end of the day. And I said, okay, because I don't know about you, but driving in Boston traffic isn't really my favorite thing. So I went down there, and I went to the uh, library in their big reading room, and it's a gorgeous room and this big tall windows uh, with the light coming through. And I just remember sitting there, having no idea what I was about to read and that it was going to change the course of my life, strangely enough. So the librarian brought out this manila folder and she put it in front of me and I opened it up and inside was this blue composition book. I haven't seen one of these in a while, but they were pretty common in schools. It was like a blue cover, and then inside it was lined. So this book was, uh, this diary was written by this woman named Phoebe Beach. And I said, well, that's interesting to me, because here's how she starts it out. 
she says, blah, 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 that she's working with her aunt and her cousins. They all insisted that I should begin keeping a journal, and aunt was most insistent. So she goes on to say, well, I'm going to go ahead and keep a diary, even though I know that they're really just kind of teasing me. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. So she says, I don't care about any of that, though. I'm going to keep a journal. Perhaps part or all of it will be foolish, but no one will see it but myself. Oops. <laughs> so I've taken my pencil tonight, and this is the first page of the journal of Miss Phoebe F. Beach, Esquire, <laughs> South Bridgeton, Maine, June 27, 1857. Well, you know, for somebody to call themselves an Esquire back then, who was a woman, I said, this is an interesting person. So I sat there and I read this diary, and I'm supposed to be transcribing it. That was my whole reason for being there. So I'm trying to type away and read the diary, and next thing you know, I pretty much have put the, TV, the, uh, the computer to the side, and I'm just reading this diary because it's an amazing story. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, what? Oh my gosh. So she's talking about being a young person growing up in South Bridgeton and, and all of the things that they did together and the school and church and all these different things. And she had a boy problem in that all of the boys in the neighborhood seemed to want to come around as though she were some, you know, flower. And they just were buzzing around her all of the time. Well, as the story went on, and I'm not going to reveal what happened next yet, but as the story went on, her life took a major turn. And it went from being this carefree girl's life to now being impacted by the growing problems in the country. And it, it's, it was amazing to me. Um, and when I got to the end of the diary, it ended on a major cliffhanger. And I sat there like, what just happened? I don't, what? What just happened? And I couldn't let it go after that. Because it was such a huge, huge moment. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this poor woman. What did she do? So that led me on this very long, I don't know, four or five years, I think, I spent with this. And I ended up um, at Bowdoin College doing research there, more research on um, her life because her uncle had gone to school there, so a lot of their letters are at Bowdoin College. So I found a bunch more stuff there about her. And then, uh, of course, I was at the different historical societies, the libraries, trying to figure out what happened to her after that. And then I actually ended up going to Virginia on a trip there. So why would I go to Virginia on a trip up for a woman living in South Bridgeton? Well, there's a reason for it, of course. But there were so many different parallels between her life and my life that I just knew there was something, there was something that, like she was communicating from the other side. I know she was. So whether you believe in that or not, she was. She was giving me instructions. So she grew up in South Bridgeton, and I grew up in South Bridgeton, two houses away from her. Of course, 125 years apart. We went to the same church, only she went to the one across the street, the old church, and I went to the new church. We were actually, even at one point in time, married to cousins. So it was one thing after another, and I thought, oh my goodness, this is just weird. <laughs> So here's some of the backstory. Phoebe Beach came to live with the Fessendens because at that point in time, um, the Fessendens never were able to have any children of their own, and so they kind of borrowed relatives. And this happened pretty frequently. So when she first got married, Mrs. Fessenden first got married, um, she had her younger brothers and sisters who had lost their father, so they were coming and staying with them. And then later on, um, a cousin, a nephew, a nephew of Mr. Fessenden's lost both of his parents, and he came to live with them, and they raised him. And then there was a daughter of one of Mrs. Fessenden's sisters who came and lived there. And then Phoebe, who was a daughter of another sister, came and lived with them. So they, uh, sorry, she was a son, she was the daughter of 
Mrs. Fessenden's brother. Sorry, too many family members. So they tended to take in other people's children. And sometimes the people wanted their children back and they weren't really wanting to send them back. <laughs> There's a, a series of letters from some parents. Uh, the, the Fessendens took in their little boy when his mother was very ill. And when, he, when she got better, they were writing letters saying, could we have our kid back now? Because wow. we really want our kid back. And they got rather firm about it at some point. And so they, they did send the child back. I'm not sure what, whether there was more to the story or not. But here's what happened with young Phoebe. She doesn't talk about this in her diary. I never would have known anything about it, except that there were letters talking about it. Um, Phoebe was the daughter of Samuel Beach, who was a uh, sailor. And as a sailor, of course, he was out here and about, and he fell in with a bad crew in Boston. And um, as a result of falling in with that bad crew, he, uh, he got married suddenly, <laughs> if you know what I mean. And he was shipping off to sea, and he was very, very determined that his child, his little girl, his new baby, was not going to be raised by the mother's family, because they were um, intemperate, and the, uh, Phoebe's grandfather was uh, cruel to his family. So Phoebe's father arranged it so that her mother would be in South Bridgeton rather than in Boston with the baby. Well, the mother got to South Bridgeton. She's used to a certain way of life in the city of Boston and, you know, the intemperate thing. And she's living a very different lifestyle in Boston. So she comes to South Bridgeton living with a very proper minister's family and it didn't go well. She was not happy there. So she wanted to go back to Boston and the Fessendens wanted her to stay with them, with the baby, and she just would not stay. So she actually leaves and she leaves the baby in South Bridgeton because the father insisted that that's the way that it should be. Well, the mother's family, and the mother was a Washburn. You may have run into that name here in, in uh, Maine. It's also a very common name in Massachusetts. It's a very prominent family. Uh, so the Washburn family decided they were going to come get the baby. So they actually came to South Bridgeton, kidnapped the child, and took her to Boston. And then Reverend Fessenden, representing the child's father, had to go to Boston. There was a big custody case that was in the newspapers. It was reported by some family letters. And so uh, Reverend Fessenden had to prove that this was the place that the child was supposed to be by the wishes of the father. So Phoebe ends up back in, um, in Bridgeton. And there are some other issues that come up. The mother's trying to get the child. And people are ganging up on the pastor because they're saying, well, you know, you just want this child for the money. And so he has to defend himself constantly. So a whole big thing going on. Well, now let's jump forward to 1857 and find out what kind of a person this Phoebe Beach turns out to be. I'm going to tell you what kind of person she turns out to be. She's a brat. Now, she's an interesting person because she has two sides to her personality. She is both a very devout young woman, um, very active in the church, as you expect a, a pastor's family to be. Uh, she's very serious. She is very much um, into writing. She's, uh, she loves school, but she's also a brat. And I'm going to tell you that when it comes to the boys in her life, she was just plumb mean. So one of the big issues for her was that she was expected to do what? Marry. She was expected to marry. That's what women did. You got married and you had children, and that was what you did. Now, if you wanted a career, um, you could be a teacher until you got married, and then that's done, and you're going to go home and raise your, your children. Um, you could be a nurse 
but the same idea. You're going to end up at, at home with your children. So her big thing was that she did not want to be a stocking darner and a baby manufacturer. Those were her words. So she's kind of trying to avoid ending up there. And that's why she, she has um, this uh, disputatious relationship with the young men in the neighborhood. Because I'm thinking she, she must have been um, probably at least very spirited and quite probably, um, I've seen pictures of her aunt, she's probably an attractive girl. But it's that spirit probably that's, um, that's bringing them in. So here's what she's dealing with at home. This is uh, 1857. Uncle and aunt have talked with me quite a time today about getting married. Now that I am the grand old age of 20, they say it is about time for me to begin to think about the subject at least. Now there's a young man who's staying with the family. Um, he is studying to be a minister, so he's staying with the Fessendens and studying under Reverend Fessenden. And his name is Frank, or as I, I've come to call him, poor Frank, because she is so mean to him. Uh, she says, Aunt informed me that Frank had talked confidentially with her and wished to know if she thought there was any reason for him to hope for favor in my eyes or something to that effect. I told her there was no reason for him to hope for any such, any, any such as favor, although I had nothing against Frank as a friend. As a husband, I should hate him, soul and body, boots, trousers and all. <laughs> Uncle laughed and Aunt said I might go farther and fare worse. I said I would prefer to go farther anyway, and as to faring worse, I didn't think that was possible, and so the subject ended. <laughs> Poor Frank. And she is just awful to him. I mean, it, it's awful. I, I had a friend who was trying to read this, and he, couldn't, he just couldn't get through it because she was so mean. I'm like, you got to just hang in there. So also in the neighborhood, I mentioned last week, there was the Fitch family, and um, Edwin Peabody Fitch, wrote uh, some of his memoirs in 90 Years of Living, and they're in the same generation. So you got this picture and you got this picture, and it's interesting to see how they match up. So Edwin had an older brother named Ansel, and Ansel was one of Phoebe's ongoing, he was interested, she wasn't. And she's being encouraged to marry him because they have a fine farm, and she would be set. And she says, I would rather set until I hatch than to have that man. And she says, because he's so fitchy. And I've seen a picture of Ansel's father. <laughs> he was not an attractive man. So if Ansel looked anything like him, I don't know. So she goes on and she just picks on poor Frank so much in this book. So of course I had to go find out more about Frank. So that gets us to the Civil War. Um, Frank, poor, poor Frank, Frank actually um, joins the army and he is part of the 16th Maine. Mm. Now the 16th Maine was, um, you've heard of the 20th Maine and Joshua mm. Chamberlain. Well the reason you've heard of the 20th Maine is because of Joshua Chamberlain, uh, because he was, a, um, he was a professor of rhetoric at Bowdoin College. So he was very good at writing and speaking and those sorts of things. So he recorded a really fantastic history of the 20th Maine, so we know what they were up to. Well, the 16th Maine uh, made it possible for the 20th Maine to be as well known as they are. Because they stepped in um, during the Battle of Gettysburg, and uh, they stepped in at a crucial moment that allowed the 20th Maine to get positioned better so that they could fight and they uh, had tremendous losses. Well, Frank was one of the people in the 16th Maine, and he was there on that day. And this is the regiment you may have heard about. They knew that they were going to fall to the Confederates, and they were determined that the Confederates would not get their flag. So they actually tore it into strips, and they um, hid it either in their boots or in their mouth, so they all took pieces of this flag and they kept it from the Confederates. And uh, there was about 100 and, I think 164 of them that were captured that day, and they ended up at Andersonville Prison. And if you've ever 
read anything about the Civil War, uh, Anderson, it was bad. Uh, it, was bad. Uh, it was unspeakably bad. And here's what happened with the prisoner of war camps during the Civil War uh, in the South. They didn't have food for their own people. So how well do you think the prisoners were treated? They had no food. They were eating rats. Um, it, it was dying of just horrible illnesses. It was a terrible, terrible thing. Well, Frank ended up there, poor Frank. And then um, he was able to survive that. And he ended up um, going back up. He had moved to Limestone at the tippy top corner of Maine um, and went on to have a good life. He built a farm, was a minister, um, was apparently happily married, had children. Uh, so poor Frank had a lot to go through. And I think maybe Phoebe toughened him up a little. I don't know. I'm just saying. So now let's go back to Miss Phoebe. Um, I love one of her quotes. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, I may not be able to find it easily, but uh, she basically says, I don't want anything in breaches near me. <laughs> she was very, very clear about that. Well, Phoebe, um, as many young women did, actually went off to be a teacher. And she went to New Gloucester, and she had a school there. Um, and the school committee was not really great to her. And she was very determined that she was going to push back, and she was going to tell that committee man what for. And she did. And he threatened her job, said that if you continue to let, this was her crime, if you continue to let your students outside to play ball at recess, I can have somebody in here to replace you very quickly. And so she thought about it, and she said, okay. And he said, oh, but, uh, 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 uh. well, there was uh, something like four weeks of the semester left or less. And so she said, I'm, I don't really like teaching anyway. I'm going to go home. So she did. I guess she showed that guy. So she had that experience that so many young women have that we see on things like, you know, Little House on the Prairie and Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. She went off and was a teacher. And she had these little kids, and one of them was just absolutely horrid to her and was, you know, just terrible, terrible, terrible in class. And so she just said, okay, well, if you dislike me that much, I think we should spend some more time together. So she'd keep him after class. And when she was uh, strict with him, he turned around. And next thing you know, he's bringing her a bouquet of flowers. <laughs> I said, well, okay, there you go. She also had a love adventure up there with a... Um, a man who was 15 years her senior, old enough to be her grandfather, and she didn't want to marry him because, <laughs> hello, he was in his second childhood. <laughs> so she comes back to South Bridgeton, and she stops by my old house, where my old house is now, um, to see her friend Leander Frost, who's a blacksmith. And she and Leander have had a wonderful relationship. He's kind of an uncle figure to her, and um, they're, they're very close, and he's always joked around with her. And so he's sticking his head out his window as she walks by from the post office. And she's giving him a hard time about some men who stick their heads out of windows and, you know, accost women passing by. So they're having this little joking fit going on. And then there's a, a laugh from inside the blacksmith shop, and she says, who's in there? And he says, well, why don't you come around and see? So she comes around into the blacksmith shop, which is not where a woman would normally turn up. You know, it's very <coughs> dirty, it's loud, it's not a place for women. Well, she meets up with this red-haired, blue-eyed young man named Arthur Jordan. And all of a sudden, Miss I don't want anything in breaches near me starts to say, well, Maybe. <laughs> and so they, they court, and um, there's a lot of uh, fun scenes in her diary about um, that process. And um, finally, she decides that she will marry him. And then he says, well, when do you want to get married? And she says, well, why don't you and aunt just figure that out and let me know? 
So she's playing the role of the man now. You know, she's like, well, you know, you two just do whatever you want, and I will just tell me what I'm supposed to wear. You know? <laughs> so it drags on because she doesn't really want to get married, and they finally decide, okay, we're going to do this. And um, I think part of the reason that they got married at the point that they did was that her uncle's health was failing. And she would have wanted him to be the one who married her. So they get married, and she goes, he comes to live at the Fessenden's house with them. And Aunt is a bit of a pill. She's very particular about everything and how it should be done, and she's not easy on poor Mr. Jordan. Um, but he bears a lot for his love of Phoebe. And that's about where the happy stuff ends. Because now we're getting closer to the Civil War. Now we're in 1861, 1862. Well, Phoebe finds out, much to her dismay, that she is carrying a child and she says, what have I done? <laughs> oh my goodness, she's not impressed by being pregnant at all. Not at all. So, after the baby is born, there's this really heartbreaking entry. And this was one of the reasons that this was so interesting for the collection at Radcliffe. So she says, here am I, not fit for much beside writing and not caring to do much of that. Over there on the sofa lies a bundle kicking and opening some great blue eyes that look quite surprised to find themselves in this miserable old world. I have been trying to convince myself that that piece of property belongs to me, but I can't succeed in doing so. It don't seem that I had any claim to that young specimen at all. Everybody calls him a real beauty. He is quite a respectable soul of a baby, though, if one must have one. Weighs nine and a half pounds at five days old, and if his adorable pa don't kiss him to death, perhaps he may make quite a man yet. She goes on with talking about the baby, and it's over there. It's over there. And he says, um, I expect I shall begin to like him as soon as I fairly understand what he is made for. And as soon as I do begin to think considerable of him, something will happen to him, I suppose. That is usually the way when folks have anything they love, I believe. So we would recognize this now as postpartum depression. But she just has this disconnect from this baby. It's over there on the couch, and I'm over here, and I guess it's a good baby. So that was one of the reasons that... Um, Radcliffe was attracted to that because it was that female experience uh, that they wanted to have as part of their collection. I'm going to keep going. Um, about, let's see, it's less than two months later. She says, our little baby is gone. I wonder if he was taken away because I did not think much of him. I did love it after all, better than I thought I did, but I don't wish it back. I think those who don't live to grow up are the most fortunate. Aunt cries half the time. She says she doesn't think I have shed a tear, but it wasn't because I did not feel like it. I don't cry very easy. It died of inflammation of the brain, was sick a week, and lived to be just six years old, six weeks old. Arthur takes his loss very hard. I don't think he will ever be contented here now. He can't seem to bear to come into the house and sit down now, though he used to like it best of anything. I don't know, but he will enter the army. Though I hope not. It may be the best thing he can do, however. But I don't like the idea somehow. So guess what Arthur does? He joins the army. And he doesn't even tell her about it. Until it's almost time for him to leave. So he joins the army, he joins the 10th Maine Regiment, and there were a lot of people locally who, who were part of the 10th Maine. The Fitch boys were part of the 10th Maine. Now the great thing with the 10th Maine was that they had a really fantastic regimental historian. Every regiment had one, and this guy's name was um, John Meade Gould, and he wrote wonderful details 
of what the regiment was up to. Um, so that was, uh, that allowed me to really track where Arthur went to. And that's how I ended up in Virginia. <laughs> so the 10th Maine originally, when they first went uh, south, they were assigned to guarding the railroad. <coughs> and they did that for a while. And then they had to, um, they actually ended up um, getting into some skirmishes. And then um, in August of 1862, they ended up in a, a big battle that a lot of people probably haven't heard of. And, and it, was, uh, it was called um, Cedar Mountain. So <coughs> the point where the, the diary ends, I said, that, I said that there was a cliffhanger. The diary ends with her copying a letter from the captain of her husband's regiment. And it says, I regret to inform you that your husband died in this battle. And that's where the diary ended. And I was like, what? So, okay. So she gets married, her uncle dies, she gets pregnant, she loses the baby, her husband goes to war, he gets killed. How do you survive that? How do you, how do you move beyond, beyond that? How do you... I, so for me, I, I was like, well, did she just throw herself in Adam's pond? What did she do? So that began that long journey for me. <laughs> I'm not sure if I should tell you what she did. But what I saw as I was doing this research, and it became the theme of the book. At first it was this interesting person whose story I felt needed to be told so that people remember what happened and we don't end up there again, let's hope. But it became about the lasting impact of that war. Because it, it destroyed several generations. The people who fought in the war, their lives were forever changed if they came back. The families that were waiting at home, wondering, is my loved one okay? Is my son coming back? Is my husband coming back? The children who were wondering if their father was ever gonna come home. And then the people who got the word that their loved one wasn't coming home and they had to face that empty chair at the table. It was huge. It was a huge, huge impact. The young women who were not married, who would they marry? And we saw this after World War I. Mm -hmm. A whole generation of men gone. And the ones that did come back, many of them suffered from what they called at that point in time, soldier's heart, which I think is a fantastic name for post-traumatic stress. So they came back impacted by this and they didn't know how to be in the world that they had left and come back to because everything had changed. They saw so much that they could never forget. So how do you come back from that? And that was, that was where the story really went at that point. What do you do? How do you come back from that? How do you go on to have a good life still when you've lost so much? Well, Phoebe did go on to have a good life still, sort of. She got married again. But then there was some strange clues that I saw along the way that led me to believe that things weren't, something was off, something wasn't quite right with her world. So after the Civil War, uh, there is a letter that she writes to her brother-in-law, her husband, uh, Arthur's brother, and she talks about how she wants to go to Washington and she wants to nurse soldiers like her husband had been nursed. And then I found another letter. One of my friends sent it to me out of the blue, and it was a letter from someone in Sebago. And um, it was a letter that someone in Sebago had written to their son who was off fighting, and unfortunately the letter never got to him because before they sent it they heard the bad news. 
But in the letter, it says this. It says, Arthur Jordan, who we thought had been killed, is alive. And it also says in the letter that his wife refused to go to the funeral because she did not believe that he was dead. And she said, I will not bury him until I know that he is dead. And so, of course, everybody in the neighborhood was like, oh, that poor woman, she's delusional. But she was right. He was still alive. And then it says that she went to Washington uh, to be with him. So as I'm doing the research, tracking all of this um, step by step, uh, the 10th Maine was involved with the Cedar Mountain battle. Those that were taken prisoner ended up at a place called Belle Isle, which is in the middle of the James River in Richmond, Virginia. Well, <coughs> guess who else ended up at Belle Isle? Uh, Mr. Edwin P.B. Fitch. So we can be pretty sure that that's where Arthur ended up as well. And then at some point, the prisoners there, some of them, the sickest, were paroled and sent to a hospital ship. Well, they had to walk to get there. So the sickest were taken to a hospital ship. That hospital ship was then taken to Washington, D.C. And that's where Arthur Jordan does die. And he's buried at Soldier's Home um, National Cemetery. And I was... I haven't been able to get there to his grave, but I have seen pictures um, of his gravestone. So we don't know whether she made it in time or not. But we do know that she had enough of an experience with that to know that she wanted to be able to help other soldiers. Now, did she go? Did she not go? We don't have any record of that. But after the Civil War, She's back in South Bridgeton. She's living with her aunt. And she's writing a newspaper. Obviously, from the way she writes in her diary, she enjoyed writing. So she's writing a newspaper, and she signs her name um, Editress. So she is the editress of a newspaper in South Bridgeton. And it's um, some of the stuff is really amusing. Uh, we have. Um, some of the articles that were from the paper. We have those at the British Historical Society. Some of them are very, very amusing. So you're like, okay, well, she's at least got a sense of humor still, so that's good. So she gets married again to a man from Freiburg. And she would have been back and forth to Freiburg all the time because she had a lot of cousins there. And then they have a baby named Mary, named for her um, sister who she lost uh, when she was young. And um, she's living in 1870. She's in South Bridgeton with Aunt and her husband, John Page from Freiburg, and uh, her daughter Mary. And I think, oh, well, good, good. And then not so good. <laughs> then not so good. So there was a lot of conflicting information from this point forward. One of my friends had sent me a death certificate for a Phoebe Page. And I said, well, that can't be her because the parents aren't right. Says the parents' father's name was Joseph Beach. Her father's name was Samuel Beach. But her uncle's name was Joseph Fessenden. Mm -hmm. No, it can't be the same person. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the woman's, uh, the mother's name was different. That was before I knew about the Washburn connection. So I said, no, that can't be it. And what would she be doing in Portland anyway? You know, her husband's in Freiburg. He's still alive. But there were all these conflicting details, right? So um, as things kind of started to come together, it turns out that really was her death certificate. She was living in Portland. Um, there was a, an address um, of where she lived when she died. And it was a rooming house. That's interesting. And her daughter Mary is there. I said, okay, well now I know it's that person. And then there are some city directories where everybody in town is listed. Mm -hmm. Now it would take so much paper, it wouldn't be worth it. But uh, So she's listed at this Green Street address. 
with her and her daughter, and it says Phoebe Page, widow of John Page. I said, well, I know that's not true. He's living right there. And <laughs> but then I found a, a diary. There's a diary at the Freiburg Historical Society uh, written by a, a man named William Gordon, and he has kept a journal of happenings in the town. Um, So-and-so did this. I'm having this work done on my house by John Page. And um, then it mentions the death of Mary. Little Mary Page dies. So, okay, well that's unfortunate. And it was not too long after her mother died. Okay. And then there's a notation in this diary that says, John Page went to the Augusta Mental Hospital. And then later on, John Page died at the Augusta Mental Hospital. So, what is going on here? And his birth certificate, uh, sorry, the death certificate for Phoebe says that she died of neurasthenia. So I'm running that around in my head one night laying in bed, and I'm like, what's neurasthenia? Neuris, it's got to be some sort of nerve thing. So I get up in the middle of the night and I'm Googling neurasthenia. And if it was something that was being diagnosed today, it might be like a chronic fatigue syndrome, something along those lines. It was a pretty common diagnosis then. It was like the it diagnosis. You don't know what's wrong with people. They obviously have neurasthenia. <laughs> I mean, there are days when I feel like I have neurasthenia. I don't even know what it is. So it just started to, to build this case and then there was something really weird that happened. Well, there were a lot of things that were weird that happened. Mary Page's death, when it's recorded by this William Gordon man, it says she died. Her father left her fine the night before. So her mother has died. Her father has obviously come to Portland to see her, or she's been, no, she had to be in Portland because she died in Portland. So he's been to Portland to see her. She was fine the night before, and then I get her death certificate. She died of an overdose. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> so she, <laughs> she dies of an overdose of chloroform. So it, it, as an author, what do you do with that? <laughs> her father left her fine. She died of an overdose of chloroform. And he ended up in a mental institution. I went in a direction with it, with that in, in the book. And I'm, I'm not going to, I don't want to do any spoiler alert kind of stuff here. So it really came down to this. We've got... Phoebe, obviously heartbroken by the loss of her husband in the Civil War. We've got John Page, who has some sort of a mental situation going on. We don't know what it is. Uh, but he also, as far as we know, served in the Civil War. So perhaps it was something along those lines. We've got Mary growing up in a house with a woman who has some sort of a nervous disorder or physical situation going on. And then she dies of an overdose of chloroform. Obviously, things are not good in their world. Now, an overdose of chloroform could have been an accidental thing, or it was a method for ending one's life. So we don't know, or it could have been murder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's hope it's not that. Yes, ma'am. Did they use chloroform as a medicine? In yes. Yep. Yeah, it was very common. Um, that was one of the anesthesias they would have used um, during the Civil War, but it was also used as a sedative. So if somebody had an upset, they would use chloroform to. Uh, but it, it's one of those things that it's it's very very light dose, and it can it can go too much very easily. Um, so yeah, chloroform was an extremely common drug at that point. How old was Mary? Mary was, I'm trying to remember, she was I think in her 30s. 
Um, Phoebe was not much older than I am. I think she was probably 58. So they, they died younger than they, they should have. So I thought that their stories all coming together like that, and there were other, um, other entries in that William Gordon diary where they talked about um, one of John Page's cousins committing suicide. He'd been in the war, he never recovered from it. So it was not an uncommon thing, just like it isn't an uncommon thing now, and it's really unfortunate um, that we put people through what we put them through. But all of those people, I think, were really indicative of the experience of people during that period of time in our history. It was absolutely heartbreaking. And in the North, they weren't dealing with the the devastation of um, their farms and their crops and their whole way of life, they weren't dealing with that in the North. So you can imagine what it was like for people living in the South and how, how difficult it was uh, for everybody just to survive it. So it's an extremely sad period of time and I think it's, um, it's valuable as a reminder of what can happen if we can't figure out how to get along with each other if we let it spin into a war. And I think it's also so important that we recognize uh, our veterans and what they go through. And a lot of what they go through, we will never know. You know, you hear about the uh, World War II veterans and how so many of them just don't really talk about their experiences. And there's good reasons for that. You know, first of all, why would you want to relive it? And secondly, how can you tell your loved ones, the horrors that you've seen. So for those reasons, I think it's a really important story. And there are a lot of Civil War books um, because it was such a, a, a difficult time in this country. And it's not a question of they were right and we were wrong or the other way around. It's really a matter of we have to learn how to find solutions in a better way than to just start shooting each other. So I'm going to leave it there. If anybody has questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yes, ma'am. How can we change that of what you normally learn? Pardon me? How can we change that of what you normally learn? Because this is a dress that would have been a typical way that people dressed at that point. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> it's crazy. And actually, I'm not wearing anywhere near as many clothes as a young woman would have been wearing, or a woman of any age would have been wearing at that point. So there's like 19 different things that a woman would have to put on before she was able to go out of the house. So she'd have to have on her pantaloons, and then she would have to have on her crinolines, her petticoats, her hoop skirt, uh, the, the actual hoop underneath, and then the hoop skirt, and then she would have had a chemise, which is like kind of like a nightgown that you wear all day, and then she would have had a blouse over that. Oh, she would have had a corset, which I'm not wearing today, <laughs> but actually, I have one with me. Let me grab that, because this is fun. Okay. Oh, yeah. So this is a corset, and a woman would have had to wear this, and she would have had to have been strapped into it, and she would have had to have a maid to help her, or a sister, or somebody, because I don't know if you've seen in old movies, sometimes they'll show women getting um, laced into their corsets, foot in the back. and the foot in the back, and, and pull the laces as tight as you can. In Gone with the Wind, the heroine, Scarlett O'Hara, had a 17-inch waist. Okay, 17 inches. So think about a ruler and less than half another ruler in your waist. I mean, we're talking like tiny, and it's ridiculous. And there are pictures of what women's um, insides, their organs, look like after wearing these for so many years because it really crunches in your midsection, and everything that's in there gets squished. It's nasty. So they would have had to wear one of these and then a blouse or a dress on top of that. 
Um, and then if they were going out somewhere, they would have had to wear a bonnet because we wouldn't want to get sun on our faces because the paler you are, the more, it, and also your hands, you would always wear gloves because you don't want to get freckles on your hands because the paler you are, the more it looked like you were a lady because you didn't have to work. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> And then uh, if you were going someplace in the winter time, you would have wool petticoats. Now imagine, now when I came here uh, to change into this outfit, I, I got to go into a nice large bathroom. Uh, imagine trying to do this before you go to school every morning in the winter time. But yeah, there was like 19 different things that women would have to put on before they left the house. And I, I saw a really fantastic um, woman do a demonstration of this. She had uh, called one of the young women out of the audience and said, okay, we're going to dress you. And they put on layer after layer after layer. And this is the summertime. I'm going to tell you that I'm hot here now. Um, and I'm not wearing my bonnet and my gloves. So it, women were very much constrained, not just by society telling them that, you know, you're going to get married, you're going to have your babies, you're going to serve the church, and that's, that's your life. You're going to take care of your home. But they were also very much constrained by their clothing. Men, not so much. I mean, they had certain things that they would wear. They were going to wear a hat if they were out in public and that sort of thing. But uh, in this area, it would have been completely acceptable for men to just be in work clothes, like it is now. You know, nobody would lift a finger or make a, a cutting remark unless, unless they smelled too much like the barn when they go to church. That might be an issue. <laughs> And did they actually have very small feet, or were they were they confined um, that way too in their little shoes? Well, the shoes were would, would have been pretty uncomfortable, <coughs> but they were actually big on boots. So they didn't. In this area, in the rural areas, you really wouldn't have seen women wearing like little slipper kind of shoes um, unless it was a special occasion. They had sturdy boots. Because when you think about it, walking down the street, there wasn't any sidewalk. The streets were not paved, so they were mud. And there's animals up and down it, wagons. And I don't know if you know this about horses. They're not potty trained. <laughs> there's no litter box. Um, so there would have been messes all over the street. There would have been mud and manure and dust and men spitting and ugh. So also an inconvenience when you're wearing a really long skirt. But they would have worn something more like boots and they would have been not necessarily comfortable but they would have been sturdy enough and um, appropriate for walking through stuff. Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Now, one of the, the problems that women ran into with wearing corsets and all of these clothing is think about this on a hot day. And yeah, they would have heat exhaustion. They would get the vapors. I've got the vapors. And they would pass out. Or they wouldn't be able to breathe because they were so um, tight in their corsets that they couldn't take a deep breath. It's crazy. So yeah. I'm telling you, okay, I would not want to dress like this. Design these, a man or something? Yes. <laughs> you know, we actually were talking about that a little earlier, and I, part of it always is going to be fashion. You know what all the cool people are wearing, but also when you think about it, a woman's not going to be able to run off if she's wearing an outfit like this, right? <laughs> right? I don't know. I'm just saying. I think that's that's part of it. But one of the issues with this particular type of dress, and this was very uh, popular in uh, Victorian England. This was like the style there, so of course we're gonna mock, uh, mock, not mock, we're going to mimic what other fashionable people are wearing, so whether it's uh, England or France. Um, forgot what I was gonna say. So anyway, we'll move on because <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> Oh, yes, I know what I was going to say. I was going to say that one of the reasons that this kind of fell out of favor would be, first of all, it's a tremendous amount of fabric, a tremendous amount of fabric. So with the, uh, the shortages of the war, there would have been a lot less fabric available to make dresses. But the other thing is all of those crinolines, 
tended to catch fire. So there were huge, huge problems with that. Uh, a lot of women burned to death because their crinolines would catch fire as they were leaning over the open fire or they were working with a cook stove. So not good, not a good thing at all. So gradually they did fall out of fashion. Um, the only time really you see this style of dress now is at weddings because brides are like, I want the poofy dress. Um, and that's why I'm able to get a hoop skirt because they're available on Amazon <laughs> because brides buy them for their, their poofy wedding gowns. <coughs> I was doing a, a talk <coughs> in Machias for a school up there and I was talking about the Civil War with the older kids and then the little kids, the little kindergarten kids, the girls were like, oh, you have a princess dress! So I had to twirl it for them. It was fun. Really cute. I think, um, uh, Wadsworth Longfellow's wife died of her crinolines. Yes. Um, it was his, yeah, uh, well, there were two of them. One, I think, was his wife and his sister. There was also something with his sister. She was actually engaged to William Pitt Fessenden when she died. But yeah, it was a, it was a pretty common thing, that, uh, the fire thing. What are so, the crinolines? Krillin is, um, is it's almost like a meshy, mm -hmm. a meshy it's a fabric tool type. kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So it's very stiff. It holds yeah. the dress out. Um, oh. and, and they washed it with this stuff, or it was just part of the fabric that they were using? It was a layer, another layer of fabric. So it was oh. like another, like, pardon me, I'm going to pull my skirt off here. <laughs> so this would have been a petticoat, and then there would have been a crinolin under this, to hold it out to keep it poofy. No. So it's like the, like bridal veils sometimes would be that kind of material. Like tutus. Tutus, yeah. So that, that would have been to, to hold the dress out to keep it nice and poofy. And you would have to have enough layers between your hoop and your outer skirt or dress so that nobody could see the actual hoops. Like you wouldn't want that hoop to be sticking out and people see your hoop. I mean, that would be like, you know, people walking around with their pants hanging down and their underwear showing. And who would do that? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully nobody we know. So the 1920s came. And then the 1920s came and everybody cut their hair off and then had like the really slim, uh, slinky, fringy kind of, we are going crazy now. And you see that a lot of times after a war. Yeah. There'll be a period of time when people, they want to forget what's happened, mm -hmm. and they want to just be free, and we're going to live it up, because, you know, who knows when we're going to die kind of mm -hmm. spirit. Uh, and so you see that over and over again. When people come out of a bad time, then the impulse is to have a good time. Well, we're going to put all that behind us. Uh, we saw it after, the, uh, after World War I, um, and particularly in this country, during that period of time in 1917, there was a horrible influenza epidemic, oh, yeah. and it killed a lot of young people, a lot of young people. Um, it started usually in the uh, army camps, mm -hmm. and it would spread very quickly, and all, all these young men uh, would contract influenza and die, mm -hmm. and then it spread across the countryside. And um, so it's kind of like we, we have these bad periods in our life and we want to forget about them and just move on. And I didn't hear about the 1917 flu epidemic until probably 10 years ago, because it was never something I'd, I'd run into at all. Uh, but I think that's, that's human nature, is we want to, when we've gone through something bad, now we want to kind of forget it and move on. And that's what people really tried to do after the Civil War. They tried to get their life back, and when they realized they couldn't get their life back, then they had to go on and create a different life with whatever pieces that were left. Um, one of, another thing that I ran into that surprised me was we kind of think of step families as more of a modern thing, but it was extremely common after the Civil War because they lost their father, uh, the widow would remarry, um, the man might lose his wife in childbirth, so he would remarry. So there were a lot of blended families back then. And I, and I think we've forgotten that. It was an extremely common thing. And you can see it in the census records. It would be Mr. and Mrs. Smith and their son, you know, Pete Johnson or something. So it was a really, really common thing, really common.
sadly, but you know, that's that's what it was at that point in time. So love your neighbor, be nice to each other. And thank you very much for coming out today. It's a pleasure to see you and a pleasure to see many of you over and over.